I'm so excited for the opportunity to talk about uh, Maggie O'Farrell's Hamnet, which is a novel that I read a little less than a year ago and fell madly in love with. So I was so excited uh, when Julia and the New Swan Shakespeare Center offered this opportunity to talk about it with all of you. One of the first things that I want to start with is the title, Hamnet, a Novel of the Plague. So I noticed that on the paperback edition, which came out recently, it doesn't have this subtitle, A Novel of the Plague, but you can see it here on the hardcover. Uh, and the title tells us a couple things. Um, so it announces Hamnet as the title character, right? And he is central to the whole novel and is the one who starts the story off. He's the first character we meet in this world. But he's not the protagonist. The protagonist is his mother, um, Anne Hathaway, who's called Agnes or Agnes in the novel. Uh, and she is really the central figure. We are mostly in her point of view um, for much of the novel. And it's about her uh, experience um, of coming to terms with, uh, with the loss of Hamnet. The subtitle of the plague, a novel of the plague, is also really interesting. So it says that it will be about the plague, and it is. But this, uh, this of is something that says not just that it's about the plague, but more than that, that the plague is something that drives it, that it emerges from the plague, um, that it's not just uh, the subject of the story, but also the context, uh, the engine of the plot, the driver of events. Plague is the crisis point. It's where the story starts, but it's not the whole story. Um, and it is sort of the, the flashpoint, but there's much more that happens beyond that. So um, it's interesting that, you know, the plague, which is this kind of central crisis, is um, identified as the, as the context of the novel. Um, but there's much more to it than that, as we discover when we read it. So beyond the obvious things, the plague... Hamnet slash Hamlet and Shakespeare, what is this play, what is this novel about? So there are a number of themes that, uh, that emerge prominently. One is the theme of death and loss and grieving that's very central to this novel, um, which is, of course, has at its center the death of, of, a, of a child, Hamnet, who was about 11 years old um, when he died. Uh, the novel is about family and parenthood. Um, and the sort of identities of people within those, uh, within those family structures. It's also about literacy and theater and art and medicine. So we know that Shakespeare is the writer and the great practitioner of the theater, but everybody in this novel has some skill that they're very good at, has their own vocation, has their own expertise. And one of the ways uh, in which this novel uh, really sort of breaks beyond the sort of, you know, the, the established genre of like, here's the story of a great artist and how he got to be that way is by exploring how other characters are artists and uh, sort of experts and masters in their own right. So Shakespeare's art may be the theater and poetry, but for Agnes, for example, her art is healing, is medicine, is understanding the natural world and being able to um, to navigate it and understand it in ways that other people can't. And this novel also kind of dwells in these border areas, these liminal spaces between life and death, between superstition and fact, and between theatricality and reality. So there is a lot of, uh, you know, it, it verges sometimes on, on aspects of the supernatural or the mystical, um, and those are important thematically to the story, but then at the same time, it deals very much with the sort of, um, with the everyday, with things that are um, facts of life and accidents such as, such as illness uh, and loss, which can't be explained away um, by a sort of, you know, which can't be explained away or, uh, or dealt with in a supernatural way. They're simply what we have to do. Uh, there are many references in the novel um, toward a sort of like a, a curtain or a border almost between, um, say, between the, the stage where the actors are performing and Agnes who's in the audience at the final scene. Or um, when Hamnet and Judith are, are seriously ill, this sort of um, very fine barrier between the, the world of the living and the world of the dead that they're kind of hovering between. So those sort of um, transitional and liminal spaces are also very present in the novel.
And there are also some ways in which it, it, the novel thwarts expectations, right? So um, there is, you know, there is an established genre of novels about, uh, about great artists, great writers. There is, you know, Shakespeare himself is a whole entertainment industry in a way, and there are plenty of Shakespeare-centric narrat- narratives. And what this novel does a little bit differently um, is, first of all, it's a historical narrative. It takes place about 400 years ago, but the whole novel is narrated in the present tense. So it creates this sense of immediacy, which is, um, which is perhaps unexpected. And also the most famous historical figure in the novel, William Shakespeare himself, is never named. He's only identified in terms of his relationship to other people. So he is the Latin tutor. He is the son, the father, the husband. Uh, he is, when we finally meet him in the context of his theater, when he's out touring with um, the Lord Chamberlain's men, he is identified as the player. So uh, he is only um, introduced in the novel in terms of his context. We never hear the name Shakespeare, even for the members of his family, his, um, his parents, his siblings. They're only identified by their first names. Uh, so there's this sort of um, constant absence uh, of Shakespeare, even if the novel is kind of about Shakespeare. And it's a very deliberate choice on O'Farrell's part. Um, you know, it's partly to kind of demythologize him, right, to, um, to put him in the context of a, of a real human who lived a real life, as opposed to the sort of legendary uh, poet who changed the course of the English language that we, that we think about now. Uh, and it's also a way of centering Agnes, of making her, without question, the center and the protagonist of the novel. Um, Shakespeare doesn't get to steal the spotlight from her at all, um, even though he is very much a participant, an active participant, and the driving force um, of the novel toward its conclusion at the theater. The structure of the novel is also something that's really interesting and that I want to spend a little bit of time talking about. Uh, It's in two parts, part one and part two, but these parts don't have chapter numbers. So it doesn't go chapter one, chapter two, which creates a sort of sense of continuous flow throughout the two parts. Part one is about twice as long as part two. It begins at a moment of crisis, and at the same time, it's an unfurling of the family history. So it tells the story of everything that led up to that moment of crisis. The first chapter begins with Hamnet's search for help, alone in the empty house, looking for somebody who can help him take care of Judith, um, who he realizes is desperately ill with what he suspects might be the plague. So it begins with our title character, um, all alone, isolated, looking for the rest of his family. And then in the second chapter, we start to meet the rest of the family. So the next chapter is a flashback to when his parents first met. And throughout the rest of part one, we have these kind of two tracks that are going. We have one part of the narration that's in the present moment, the moment of crisis with the twins' illness and everything that's happening um, around that. So the search for the family, the search for a doctor, the attempt at medical care, the sort of um, frantic sending a letter to the absent father to try to get him to come home in time. And at the same time, we have the, um, the flashback narrative. So we have the story of how Anius and Shakespeare met. We have the stories of uh, their own upbringing and family life we have the story of the births of their children. So first Susanna, the eldest daughter, and then the twins, um, Hamnet and Judith. And those storylines start to converge towards the end of part one. And at the end of part one, you have in the flashback uh, narration track, you have the birth of the twins. And then in the present moment, you have the death of one of the twins. And that's where those storylines converge and part one ends there. These alternating chronologies are all narrated in the present tense, which is a really, uh, it's kind of a bold choice uh, on the part of O'Farrell because it doesn't allow us to be distant from it. It means that we're always in the moment with the characters as they're experiencing these things. And it's also a way of making the past feel very immediate. So even though this is a, a story that, that took place over 400 years ago. It, it feels very um, 
it feels very current to us because of, uh, because of that present tense. And it also is a way of making sure that these two tracks of the story are completely intertwined. So there's never a sense that the, um, you know, the, the meeting of the parents is at some distance removed from the crisis that the family is facing now. The birth of the twins and the death of the twins are all happening on the same kind of chronological plane. So uh, there's, no, there's no separation. Everything is overlapping and everything is connected and intertwined. In the second part, after the crisis, from the moment of Hamnet's death onward, the chronology of the novel moves forward. So we go from, uh, from the moment of Hamnet's death or immediately after it, the immediate aftermath, up into, until the production of Hamlet at the Globe Theatre in London, which is about four years later. And this is a pretty relentless forward momentum. Um, and in fact, it sort of skips over whole seasons in some ways. Um, you know, it, it puts a whole season or a year into a few paragraphs in some places um, to kind of give a sense of, of not just the passing of time, but the kind of sameness of that time as it passes where the family is so mired in grief, um, Agnes in particular, so mired in grief that she can't think about um, the present or the future. If there are any flashbacks, they're, they're pretty short. And rather than filling in the narrative, as the flashbacks were doing in part one, they're sort of providing the context of a, of a memory or some kind of emotional background, but they're not moving the narrative forward in the way that they do in part one. And in both part one and part two, we have these kinds of doubled and mirrored events. So there are births and deaths in both parts. Um, we have the birth of Susanna and then the birth of the twins, which are um, sort of parallel events, but also very, very different. We have, um, we have deaths uh, in, throughout the novel. So, there, so Hamnet's death, of course, is at the center, but there are references back to um, the deaths of uh, Shakespeare's younger siblings, uh, of Agnes's uh, mother, um, her birth mother before her father remarried. Uh, and then there are the theatrical epiphanies, which conclude each part. So part one, uh, in the narration of the twins' birth, at the moment of the twins' birth, intertwined with that is the story of Shakespeare's theatri first theatrical epiphany, the story of his arriving in London, learning about the life and career in the playhouse, and really starting to find his footing and come into himself and reach his full intellectual and creative potential that he had never been able to reach when he was at home in Stratford because this was an art form and an industry that he barely knew existed, right? Um, so he's coming into his own and discovering what his future career and life is going to be um, toward the end of Agnes's pregnancy, um, and so there are letters that are coming shortly before she goes into labor with the twins, describing his sort of um, excitement and thrill at, at the possibility of a life in the theater. And this is something that she doesn't quite understand. And she won't until the very end of the novel, when she makes it to London and goes to see Hamlet and all of a sudden starts to understand what it is that her husband really does. And in a sense, who he really is outside of the scope of their domestic life. So those two theatrical epiphanies um, sort of bookend uh, part two. One comes right before and one comes right at the very end of the novel. There's also a lot in the book about writing and authorship, um, primarily asking the question, who are the writers and the creators in this novel and who are the readers? So we think immediately, well, obviously Shakespeare is the writer, right? Uh, but he's not the only one. And there are different modes of writing, different modes of reading and understanding. Um, one of the things that's, that really struck me as I was rereading the novel um, for this session was that there are all these descriptions of learning to read um, where the children are learning from their parents or from their older siblings. And there are these really intimate forms of engagement. Um, right, where uh, Agnes reflects on her mother drawing letters for her in the dirt. So this really sort of like physical um, action uh, where there's a sort of conflict between Susanna and Judith in trying to get the younger sibling to uh, 
learn her text and she's, you know, she's sort of struggling with learning how to read. Um, so there's this sort of, uh, there's a way in which reading and writing, even though the, the different characters um, have different levels of proficiency and different levels of comfort with it, is something that is very much part of their uh, domestic and familial world. There's also other kinds of literacy, right? One of the things that um, that is remarkable about Agnes as a character is her ability to kind of read people and read the natural world, that she's extremely perceptive. Um, she's very good at understanding people's um, motivations and their psychology. And there's, this, there's an almost sort of mystical quality to that. It's described as, you know, a way that she, she touches someone's hand and is able to kind of um, access their inner, their inner being through that. Even if we set aside that kind of more fantastical element, there's still uh, a lot that shows how perceptive she is. For example, in the way that she does this kind of social engineering, right, to achieve things within the family. She knows that Shakespeare's father will respond very badly if he's asked for something. So she manages to plant the idea kind of indirectly in order to get what her family needs. The only written text that we see in full is the letter that Eliza, Shakespeare's sister, sends to him to let him know that Judith is ill. This is the way that it is set in the hardcover edition. So um, if you're reading, uh, when I read this for the first time, it was in a digital edition, so I didn't see this. Um, but as you can see, it's set apart in a different font. It's larger. Um, it's written with you know, an attempt at, at some period spelling. It's really, uh, so it really stands out uh, stands out visually. It's very, it's a very interesting choice uh, to make that um, to make that the literary centerpiece in a way of the play. We do have Hamlet. We have references to plays and poetry. We have references to other kinds of writing. But that's the only, um, you know, for for a novel that is ostensibly about a writer, that's the only writing that we really get to see in full, which I think is an interesting choice. And it also raises the question of whether writing is a public or a private act. And is it something that's generative, right, that, that creates something for other people, or is it totally self-indulgent? And I think the book is kind of trying to explore both of these angles. So I was really struck by this passage um, early on, which describes Eliza goes looking for her older brother, and it turns out that he's hidden away in the attic, which has, which he's turned into his writing room. So he's sitting there, you know, so he's writing, but he's hidden away. He's doing something secretive. And, um, the narrator says for a moment, Eliza thinks he might be doing the thing that boys or young men do. Sometimes she has enough brothers to know that there is something that happens in private and they are ill tempered <laughs> if interrupted. So she doesn't know quite what she's up, what he's up to. She doesn't know that he's writing, but she does um, imagine that what he, whatever he's doing is something that is uh, self-indulgent. Let's say um, she, uh, I mean, not to be crass, but she imagines he might be masturbating, right? So um, she thinks it's something that, that is not for anybody else, right? Except for himself. What's interesting is that there, there is something about that in writing, especially for Shakespeare at that point in his life when he hasn't shown his writing to anyone. It is something that is self-indulgent and that is just for himself because he doesn't yet have a way of putting it out into the world. And it made me think um, of how in, in the, the, not the fictional Shakespeare of the novel, but the real Shakespeare whose writing survives today, there is sometimes this sense that writing is a form of, of reproduction of the self and that it can be self-indulgent if it doesn't create something for later. So just... Um, on that theme, a couple of excerpts from his sonnets. So here's one from Sonnet 3, which carries this, uh, this sense of, of how, um, how the act of writing is an act of self-perpetuation. So this is, he's writing to, uh, to the beloved, telling him to, um, to reproduce himself, right? Look in thy glass and tell the face thou viewest. Now is the time that face should form another. But if thou live, remembered not to be, die single, and thine image dies with thee. So in the context of the sonnets, it's about the sort of waste of um, the youth and his beauty if he doesn't create a copy of himself in the world. And it's sort of what Shakespeare, the fictional Shakespeare in the novel, seems to be struggling with. How does he create a copy of himself into the world? Until he can do that, it's all just self-indulgence. 
And um, the same idea famously comes up in Sonnet 18, the one that starts, shall I compare thee to a summer's day, um, which also offers this idea um, that writing itself is a form of reproduction and commemoration. So it's offering kind of the kind of the flip side of that argument that, um, you know, the youth has to um, has to recreate himself by having a child, but the poet can recreate himself and create a, a version of himself in the world by continuing to write poetry um, and by creating that copy with another person. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this and this gives life to thee. It might be a little bit of a stretch, but I thought it was an interesting, um, an interesting parallel with some of, uh, some of the themes that, that show up in, um, more in the sonnets than in the dramas. And it raises the question, too, of where Shakespeare's actual writing is in this novel. So we have this letter. We have references to the plays. Um, and there's really, you know, it's a, it's a pretty um, common trope around plays or novels or films or other artworks that are kind of an homage to Shakespeare or a parody of Shakespeare or um, a fictionalized version of Shakespeare's life, that there's a lot of references to the language, right? One of my favorite examples is the film Shakespeare in Love, which is, you know, which has, which is almost a pastiche of, um, of lines from different plays, sort of like Shakespeare's greatest hits showing up as, uh, as punchlines in the dialogue. We don't have any of that here. Um, but we do have these sort of um, more subtle references. Uh, I think O'Farrell was really cautious and really conscious of not going too far into that pastiche. So the few things that she drops in that are explicit references to Shakespeare are, um, are very deliberate. So one is in the plot and elements. So we have twins, right, like in Twelfth Night and, uh, and other plays. We have the liminal forest, right? So the forest is this kind of otherworldly space where Agnes goes to uh, to commune with her mother, to give birth to her first child, to understand something about the natural world. Um, and that's like the forest of Arden or like the forest outside of Athens in A Midsummer Night's Dream where the fairies are running amok. So we have this sort of um, natural space that is that is somewhat otherworldly. Uh, cross-dressing. The first time that Shakespeare sees her, he thinks that she's dressed like a man. It turns out she's not. She's just wearing a, a man's doublet over a dress. But at first, uh, he thinks he sees a handsome youth, <laughs> and it turns out to be a woman. And then there are the funeral scenes. So the first one is a, is a flashback to the burial of Shakespeare's younger sister, who died of the plague. The second is, of course, Hamnet's own funeral. And the way that both of them are, uh, are described in terms of the sort of the, the landscape, the heightened emotion, the specific, not so much in the language, but in the kind of affective sense of it, um, seemed to me to be very deliberate echoes of Ophelia's funeral, in, uh, funeral scene in, Ham in Hamlet. Uh, and also the description um, of sewing up Hamnet's shroud with flowers and herbs uh, made me think also of Ophelia drowned with all of the flowers on top of her. Um, these page numbers, by the way, refer to the hardcover edition. So if you're if you're looking at an ebook or the paperback, they might be different pages. There are also um, what I'd call oblique citations and reimaginings of some famous. Um, of some famous lines, like at one point Shakespeare says, all's well, which we all know is the, is the title of the play. Um, Hamnet in the, narrator, in the narration says, in the first chapter and then in the last moment before he dies, he says, first there's nothing, only silence, and then there is silence, stillness, nothing more. And these seem to me to be deliberately recalling Hamlet's final line in the tragedy, the rest is silence. That's the last thing that Hamlet says before he dies on stage. And it's, um, you know, so it's not, a, it's not a direct quotation, but it does seem to evoke that. And anyone who knows the play Hamlet would pick up on that, I think. And then finally, there are two explicit quotations from the play. One is, who's there? That's the first line of the play, Hamlet. And it shows up numerous times in the book. First, when in the first chapter, when Hamlet is running around looking for help, the second two times, it's spoken by uh, by Agnes when she's looking for looking for assistance, 
looking for her son. She thinks he's there. Uh, the one on page 274 is actually when Shakespeare has arrived and is banging on the door, um, trying to get trying to get there before his child is gone. Right. So that so that's one explicit quotation that shows up. The other one is "Remember me," which is what the ghost says to Hamlet in the tragedy, and which is the very last line of the novel. And that really establishes um, the fact that the that the that the novel itself is meant to be a form of commemoration and that this fictionalized version of Shakespeare writing the, writing the tragedy of Hamlet is deliberately commemorating the life of his son.